turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah, as you know, was called the weeping prophet. Don Nesbitt, YouTube. Chapter 9 in Jeremiah, beginning with the first verse. Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they be all adulterers and an, assemb an assembly of treacherous men. Well, that's a, a, a feeling that many Christians have at some times uh, in their lives, in their walk, if they strive with lost people or rebellious Christians, uh, and they don't get any encouragement or support from other Christians, they <laughs> they want to they want to escape. They want to find a place where they could just hide out and say, well, I'm not going to continue this anymore. I'm not getting anywhere. Jeremiah was opposed by everybody. Now, this is the attitude that a Christian must be willing to accept. Uh, you get saved. If you want to be a disciple, you have to have what the Scripture said, let, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. You have to accept the fact that you could, you'll be ridiculed and disparaged by even your brothers and sisters. You have to be willing to go outside the camp bearing his reproach. If being a King James Bible believer puts you at odds with other Christians, so be it. So be it. Don't lose any sleep over it. You're going to be judged by the Lord. You're going to appear at his judgment seat. There is no judgment seat for Christians to judge other Christians. That's not going to happen. And the reason there's so, so many problems with Christians in this area is because of sensitivity. Uh, we don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to be looked down upon. We don't want to have our, our Christian zeal or passion uh, questioned. But it will be because of the different stands you might take. And Jeremiah was alone. He was a weeping prophet, weeping because he saw that his people wouldn't hearken. The, 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 the princes, the king, the whole bunch of them, the nobles in Jerusalem, it went in one ear and out the other. They, it, they weren't going to turn. And the Lord had to tell Jeremiah very sadly, uh, don't pray for these people. I'm, I'm finished with them. I'm going to destroy them. And he can't change that. Jeremiah can't change that. You say, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Yes, sometimes. Yeah. But when the Lord's mind is made up, it's made up. That's it. Uh, <laughs> there are times that great men of God have changed the mind of the Lord. Like when Moses, when the Lord wanted to wipe out Israel. And Moses stood in the breach there and reminded the Lord, hey, everybody who knows about you delivering us from Egypt and all the great miracles is going to say, what happened to your God here? He couldn't bring you into the promised land. What happened? He failed. And that, that resonated with the Lord. So there are times you can present an argument to the Lord, and the Lord might say, listen, it's okay, all right. You, you moved me to change my mind. How about that woman? That, and the Lord says that, you know, the, the bread is for the children only, not the dogs. And she admitted, yeah, well, I'm a Gentile dog. Sure, you're right. Uh, the bread is for the children of Israel. But even the dogs, uh, you know, eat the crumbs that fall off the table of the children. And, and for that answer, the Lord gave her healing. For that answer, uh, was it her healing or her son's? I'm not sure. I got to look at that. But I realize there are times when you might have a point that you can present to the Lord that's a legitimate point, and you might move the Lord to change his mind. But in this particular instance, here in, Jer uh, in, in Jerusalem at this time, the Lord was determined. He, he had to wipe the slate clean and destroy the temple. Now, this is what the Jews never thought would ever happen. No matter how bad things got, they had said, well, Jerusalem, his name is here. The temple is here. Here's where we come to sacrifice to the Lord and receive atonement on Yom Kippur. They thought that would never change. That was the anchor of their faith, so to speak. And uh, it, it just, it was inconceivable to them. 
that their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would, would allow a heathen army to come in and wipe them out and destroy the temple. Oh, it, it just, <laughs> what a shock. Now, I'm saying this because Christians uh, who backslide and then become perverse in their way and, and follow the way that they know is wrong, uh, sometimes can be lulled into thinking, well, the Lord hasn't come down upon me yet. Now, he might not even come down upon you while you're still alive down here. He just might ignore you, just leave you alone and give you over to your own ways. But let me tell you something. All of this is going to come up at the judgment seat of Christ as to your record of service. And it won't be forgotten. It won't be forgotten. So saying, well, I'm saved, at least I'm saved, I, I know that, that's not going to get you over when you appear before the Lord. That's not going to be acceptable. Yeah, you were saved by his blood and by the skin of your teeth. Let me tell you something. You had no part in it. It was the Lord just showing mercy. But what did you do after that? How did you respond to his mercy? Did you give up your body? Like he said, present your body as a living sacrifice. Did you present yourself to the Lord? Did you say, I'm here to serve you, Lord? That's what I want to do for the rest of my days. Well, you just went about your business. Now, it says here in Jeremiah 9, verse 3, and they, of Jerusalem, that is, their tongues, they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Isn't that a sad thing to say about your own people? Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. And they will deceive every one his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation, he's talking to Jeremiah, thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Through deceit they refuse to know me. You know, I, I want to stop at this point here. When you're crooked, you see, even after getting saved doesn't change the fact that you have an old nature and you are crooked in your heart, Okay. Nothing changes about that nature when you get saved. And you've got to just accept that. Uh, and you've got to deal with it through the power of the Word of God and by pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. Your whole Christian life is an exercise in putting down the old nature. It never stops. It'll go on until you die. Now, he says here, "...through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord." This is a willing thing. They refuse. They can know him. They are able to know him. Christians can know the Lord. Christians can get things out of the Bible. The Lord will be more than happy to reveal, thing, reveal stuff to them. They can know whether they're going about it, something the right way. They can get wise counsel. They have access to all the graces of God, all the, the wisdom that's found in the Word of God. They have access to that. But it says here, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Why? Why won't they open the Bible and, and, and read some of this Old Testament stuff or sit under a preacher that really preaches hard against sin and, ju and preaches judgment? Why? They refuse. They, they, they don't want it. They don't want to know the other side of the Lord. They don't want to know the Lord because he will be a problem in their lives. He will be a problem. That's why. Through deceit, they deceive themselves. Well, I'm saved. I'm okay. God loves me. See, the, the, the love gospel has a lot to do with the, the miserable state of Christianity today in the United States of America. It has a lot to do with it. And these are people who refuse to know me. It's like you, I, I said this before in another broadcast, you invite the Lord into your heart and your body, soul, and spirit. That's, that's his tabernacle. He moves in. That's your house. 
and then you confine him to one or two rooms. And you, you make sure the other rooms are off limits. You don't want to give him the key to those rooms. Those are the things that you cherish. And you do not want the Lord to interfere with the things that you cherish. You're afraid the Lord might rearrange the furniture. So you limit him. That's what's happening over here. They, the Jews had gone so far, all they had left was a formal worship showing up at the high holy days, having a Passover Seder. There was no practical uh, zeal in their faith at all. It all fell apart. And unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians in that position, although many of them are good at hiding it. There's a dark side to people, you know. And some Christians are very clever keeping that under wraps from the brothers and sisters. Uh, I've talked to Christians about that. I think I mentioned once to you that the moon uh, is symbolic of the body of Christ. And we only see one side of the moon, just one side. The light of the sun shines on the moon. The sun being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, shining on the moon. That light, from the sun is reflected to earth. The body of Christ gives light to the earth. We go out with the gospel. We try and get people saved. We try and show them what the truth of God is. So it's the sun beaming on the moon and that light reflecting on the earth. But here's the thing. We, the earth, only sees one side of the moon. It sees that Christian side where light has fallen from the sun. It does not see the dark side. There is a dark side to every Christian. The Christian does not want that dark side, and God in his mercy does not show that dark side. He only shows the light. You are in the sight of God, if you're saved, justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You appear to him sinless, but you know better, and the Lord knows there is sin in you. Like Paul said, in me dwelleth no good thing. But God in his mercy covers that. Now, there are times when a Christian becomes so perverse, it can't be covered. His life becomes a scandal, and everybody winds up saying, well, if that's the kind of Christianity he or she represented it, uh, represented, I want no part of it. And that's what the devil loves. What the devil wants to do is get that dark side out and then reflect it to the people you deal with so that he could destroy you, take away your testimony, destroy your credibility. And sadly enough, God, God's people don't see this happening in many cases, and it happens to them. It happens to them. And when you lose credibility, it's very hard to get it back. If you do get it back, it's very hard to get it back. And I've talked to Christians about this, and they've asked me, what, what do I do? I says, you, you get down, you open a book, you open your heart to God, and you tell him you're willing to do whatever he shows you or tells you. That's the only way you can recover some of your credibility. Maybe not all, but some of it. You'll be credible again. Maybe you have to leave town and go to another place and start all over again. You know, years ago, these, these outlaws in the West, I remember reading where many of them had trouble back in the East. They had gotten into trouble with the law. And they wanted a new start. Many of these people went West because they wanted to pick up and start all over again and try and do right. Many of them did. Many of them did. But that evil nature, you know, can a leopard change his skin? Uh, it, it, I mean, can an Ethiopian change his skin? Can a leopard change his spots? You can't. It's with you until you die. Now, Jeremiah says here in verse 7, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them, for how shall I do for the daughter of my people? He's going to melt them. Hey, by the way, do you know what the judgment seat of Christ, your works, if your works weren't done, for the Lord Jesus Christ, and they weren't from his spirit, guess what happens to your works? They melt. They get burned up. So there's the melting. Look at verse 8. Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in heart he layeth his 
people away. This is the double uh, uh, side of many Christians, the dark side. You know, sometimes you can discern it and pick it up. Sometimes you can't. Uh, sometimes re rebellion is very well covered, very well camouflaged. And you know, only real sharp preaching by a spirit-filled preacher who knows how to use that scalpel, that knife, and he hits the right place, and out it comes. You'll hear that that rebellion will just seep out. I don't like what the preacher said. I, well, that's his opinion. Well, he went too far. Well, I don't like the tone of his voice. It's going to be something in there that has to react to the fact that the Christian listening to that sermon got stabbed. And that's what a sermon is supposed to do. That's what I want when I go on a Sunday. I want to be stabbed. I want the Lord to show me. Look, here's a boil here. We got to break it. We got to get the pus out. We got to clean you up. We got to put a drawing salve on you. Get the filth out and the poison. Amen. Doesn't he say that to the lady you'll see in church? Anoint your eyes with eye salve. What do you think salve is? It's a salve is designed to draw out the pus and the dirt. He says, anoint. They were pus in their eyes. They were. Their eyes were no good. They weren't seeing right. They lost their discernment. They were in bad shape, very bad shape. They were lukewarm and didn't even know about it. And the Lord looked at them like they were detestable, like, oh, I can spew, spew you out of my mouth. You, don't, you give me no pleasure whatsoever. And they weren't even aware of it. God help you. God help any Christian listening to this. If you think you're okay with the Lord only to find out that you're not. What a surprise. What a shock that's going to be. So listen to some strong preaching and go before the Lord humbly and say, Lord, what do I need to see? Not what I like to see. What do I need to see? Help me, Lord. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to begin with verse 24. Here's a question. Is God cruel? <laughs> Obviously not. I mean, John said, God is love. That's what he wrote in his epistle. God is love. Can love be cruel? Well, is that the right word? Can love be angry? Yes. Can love be wrathful? Yes. Can it be cruel? Well, let's look at these verses and see what you think. See what you come up with. Proverbs 1, starting with verse 24. Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Now, brothers and sisters, you cannot look at this portion of Scripture and think there's cruelty here. Now, I, I know we're not willing to use that word in anything connected with God because we know that God is love. But try and see this differently now, especially look at this verse. I also will laugh at your calamity I will mock when your fear cometh. Imagine that. Here's God looking at his own people. And because they would take none of his advice, 
and something evil comes upon them, God in heaven is laughing at their calamity? Could you believe that? He's, he's mocking them. <laughs> Look at you. Could you believe that? My God, that's part of who he is? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, how do I, why do we have such a, a hard time of embracing this? Because we know the goodness of God. We've experienced it in our lives if you're saved. We haven't seen his wrath. We haven't seen his wrath. We'll be in heaven, thank God, if you're saved. You'll be caught up to be with the Lord. You'll be spared. You'll be spared a sight. I, I don't know how any human being is going to be able to live uh, with what's going to happen in the tribulation. Think about it. Two-thirds of the world's population. Look, there are seven and a half billion people on this planet right now. And if I'm reading the book of Revelation co uh, correctly, when the smoke clears, there's going to be five billion casualties. Two-thirds, five billion casualties, dead. Jesus talked about it, the, the worst time ever known to man. There's been nothing like it. Is God cruel? Well, when he lets go and his wrath is poured out, are you going to say God is love? Now, in the midst of all of that, there'll be people saved. There'll be millions and millions and millions of souls saved during the tribulation. There'll be a Jewish remnant saved. There'll be millions of Gentiles who will refuse to take the mark. They'll hold on. They'll hold on. Somehow, some way. Millions will be, won't. They'll give up. They'll take the mark. They want to see their families fed. But there'll be millions who will not. And they will be saved. They, they need to remain faithful unto the end. They need to keep the commandments of God. There's that stipulation, which you and I don't have to worry about. But there is a, a wrath to God. Listen, it shows up to some degree at the judgment seat of Christ. When Paul talks about the judgment seat of Christ, our Lord, he, he talks about knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He's talking to Christians there, knowing the terror of the Lord. Terror, terrorism at the judgment seat of Christ? Yeah, yeah. What's going to terrorize you? What's going to terrorize you and I at the judgment seat of Christ is this reality we're going to have for the first time. We don't have it now. We're going to have a reality like nothing we could imagine right now. And that reality is going to be all the opportunities that were given us to serve the Lord, to please the Lord. All the blessings that were missed because of our failures. All of them. More than you could ever imagine. That reality is going to smack us right in the face. It's going to be hard to swallow. And then the reality of seeing a lot of our effort, which we thought was in the Lord, in the Spirit, was actually our own flesh. And that goes up in smoke. Burns up. Gone. What a reality we're going to experience. We don't see these things now. Sin blinds us, and sin is in every believer. If we say we have no sin, we lie, and the truth is not in us. We have sin in us, and it blinds us to a degree. We're going to be faced with some reality. And when we come back, following the Lord, the army from heaven following the Lord, we're going to see a devastation and a destruction of this planet like you and I can never fathom right now. We just can't comprehend it. There'll be nuclear holocaust on this planet. And then you and I as Christians will see what the wrath of God did to sinful man. You will see the price human beings paid for sticking their fist in our Lord's face. We will not have this man to reign over us. You'll be sorry. You'll take the Antichrist to reign over you. You'll be okay with him until it becomes clear you've made a tragic mistake and you won't be able to escape that wrath. 
The lost will hide in caves, holes of the rock. Hide us from what? From the wrath of the Lamb. You mean a lamb can have wrath? Oh, brothers and sisters. We get it. We get a little taste of it there at the judgment seat of Christ. I hope it's not too much. It scares me to think about it. It should scare you. It should scare us. So we get really concerned with our actions, the way we're living our life, the opportunities God gives us to serve him. So I, this is a point. Listen, you go to any church, any so-called mega church or whatever, you're never going to hear this portion of scripture read that I just read to you. Read it to some Christian, some wishy-washy carnal idiot that's been saved for years and years and years and never grew. Read this portion of Scripture to them and then ask them, is God love? And they'll say, well, yeah. Well, then explain this. If God is love, explain this to me. This is not the devil that's in heaven laughing and mocking his own people as they go through all kinds of calamities and disasters. This is not the devil. This is the Lord God Almighty laughing. Talk about sarcasm, being sarcastic. Now, this is too much. This is too much for a lot of God's people. This forces you to look at this in a different way. God is love, but what kind of love? It's a perfect love and a perfect hatred for sin. Get the balance here, brothers and sisters. There's a balance. Perfect love, perfect hatred. Perfect forgiveness, perfect long-suffering, perfect punishment, perfect wrath. Everything is in balance. We want to see what we want to see down here. We don't get the right balance. We tend towards the positive. And now we're living in a society where, oh boy, everything's got to be positive. You might damage somebody's self-esteem. Oh, God forbid. No, we can't, we can't handle anything negative anymore. No, no, no. We got to have a, a society where it, it appears everything is going to work out to man's favor. Somehow, some way, it's all going to work out. It doesn't. That's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. It doesn't work out. People get sick. People die. People go to hell. I told that to one woman where I used to work. She said, you're so negative. I says, well, I'm realistic. You could say negative, I say realistic. She says, well, nobody can work around you. I mean, it's just, I'd rather be with someone who's positive. I says, I could understand that. That's understandable. I said, you could live in lollipop land all you want. It's not going to change things. She says, what do you mean by that? I says, here's life, lady. Listen to me. And if you went to school... Tell me if I'm wrong, because I want to learn. Here's life. You're going to get old, you're going to get sick, and you're going to croak. And all the positive thinking in the world is not going to change that. Am I right or wrong? Correct me if I'm wrong. So, no, I can't, can't hear this. This is. A, I said, see what I mean? You want to live in Disney World. Just, just get a, move to Disney World. Get a job there. Play with the kitties all day in the Magic Kingdom. That's not life. Reality is what God says it is. Sin brought into this world sickness and death and hell to follow unless you're reconciled to God by virtue of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only way you can get God's wrath off your back from over your head ready to burst on you at any moment. No, this is something the world doesn't want to hear, brothers and sisters. You say that the gospel is good news. It's good news to someone who's tired of sin. It's good news to someone who's looking for forgiveness. Someone that's been broken by sin, hurting. Someone who thinks maybe they've done so much evil they can't be forgiven. It's good news. Someone that's messed up in life. It's real good news. But that, that group of people who welcome it and see it as good news is shrinking. 
It's getting smaller and smaller each year. And we're living in that kind of society now where it's not seen as good news. It's negative. Folks don't want anything to do with it. Listen, it doesn't deter me. It doesn't deter me one bit. And the Lord told me. I mean, really. He tells me what to expect. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. I mean, what am I going to expect? People didn't jam into his boat when they got the negative news of what was coming. Nobody jammed into his boat. I guess he was blessed that he even got his family in there. Who knows if he even had opposition from them? We don't know. But they got in there. Thank God. The Lord was really gracious to him. Got his whole family on board and then let judgment fall. Well, something worse than that is coming. But you can't tell that to people. Hollywood's not going to make a movie about it and scare the daylights out of people like that because if it mentions the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not going to sell it. They don't want it. Listen, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. I've got, I've got a concern. I've got something ahead of me. First of all, meeting the Lord and seeing him face to face. Amen. But there's something that follows immediately thereafter. And that's a worry and that's a concern. I've got to appear because Paul tells me, the scripture tells me, for we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. I can't hide out in a closet, wait till everybody is called, and then sneak away. I'm going to appear and I'm going to have to give an account. And it scares me because Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Are you a little bit afraid? Are you afraid enough to dedicate your life totally to the Lord Jesus Christ, serve him from here on in unreservedly so that you'll have a smile there at the judgment seat of Christ. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Boy, oh boy. In his presence is fullness of joy. We don't have that now. We don't even have anything close to that. Oh, we've got good times and periods of happiness and joy. But fullness of joy, we don't know that. We will, and it'll be so much the better if you could walk away with some rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, wouldn't it? Amen. Amen. Please open your Bible to Revelation chapter 3, and uh, we're going to take a good look again at the condition of the church in these last days of the church age. Because that's where we are. That's timely. It's more timely now than ever before. Time is moving. We're into 2016. And hopefully the Lord will come this year. You know, I, I wrote some Christian brothers that I have in uh, prison. And uh, both of these guys are doing life. I don't know if they'll ever get out. Life for murder. And we're talking about writing back and forth about time and using the time. And I mentioned to them that the clock is on our side. The, the clock is for us. I said, I don't know how much longer you'll have to wait for that giant prison escape that you're looking forward to, Titus 2.13, the blessed hope. But it'll come, and it's getting closer and closer and closer with each day and each week and each month that passes the Lord is moving closer to us, and it'll happen. So time is our friend, although in prison you might have a hard time believing that, but it's so. I says, you know, uh, when I worked in the city, New York City, actually, all those years, uh, going back and forth to work, on, on Monday mornings, uh, especially after a long weekend, you had everybody coming in looking like they had lost their best friend or their dog died over the weekend horrible expressions on their face, sadness, depression. And I realized, well, these people have nothing to look forward to, really. They, they look forward to Friday. They, they, they seem to come alive Friday because it's the end of the work week and they're going to have their fun. So they live for weekend to weekend to weekend. Uh, I, as a Christian, I don't have that. I, so I used to come to work Monday morning happy, uh, joyful, simply because I'm saved and I know where I'm going, and uh, would be humming a hymn to myself or a tune. They'd look at me like, well, what's the matter with you? I said, well, uh, uh, let, let me be 
honest and frank with you. I don't have your spirit. I have a different spirit. Uh, You birds are living from weekend to weekend. That's what you're looking forward to. And one day your weekends end and you drop dead and you go to hell. Okay? That's it. Me? No. (laughs) My end is different. I'm enjoying myself down here as a Christian. And I especially enjoy when I see your faces get twisted when I give you the truth. I enjoy that a lot. I says, and in the meantime, I'm not concerned about whether it's Friday or Monday. My spirit is the same. It's the same Monday morning as it is Friday afternoon. I like Friday afternoon because I'm another day closer to uh, Sunday and having a service and and being with my fellow Christians. I says, you people have nothing like that going for you. So I guess if I were in your state, I'd be miserable like you. Uh, They didn't appreciate that, but there was nothing they could do about me because I had the blessing and the privilege of God in my job. I was permanent as a civil servant, and in New York City as a civil servant, uh, you have to come in drunk and kill somebody uh, before they can fire you. That's how hard it is to fire a permanent civil servant. So with that uh, privilege, I was able to say what I wanted to say, basically when I wanted to say it, and there was nothing they could do about it. And as far as holding me back, well, you're not going to get a raise or whatever. It didn't matter because my raises came from competitive examination. The next step up in my title required me to take an exam, uh, which I always passed, and uh, I'd get the, uh, the salary boost and the increase. And it just made them more angry and upset. But I thank God for that because uh, I was able to feed my family and pay my bills and thank the Lord for that. Now, getting back to Revelation 3, the church at Laodicea, and you know, probably if you're in your Bible, you know all about this, but let's look at this again. There's an eye problem here. There is an eye problem. And uh, they can't see. They have trouble seeing things the way God sees them. So in verse 17, in chapter 3, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Well, you know, these guys, Joel Osteen, and Rick Warren, and all these uh, Christian megastars, who who, uh, feel, well, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. Well, you are so pathetically blind, you might as well move into the Vatican with his holiness over there uh, because you're pathetic, okay? And uh, all I could say is God help you if you're really saved. God help you at the judgment seat of Christ. Have a good story. Come up with something uh, because it's going to be really rough there for you. Now, this thing about being blind, he says in verse 18, Uh, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. Now, you got to be careful here. I I put next to it 1 Peter 1, uh, verse 7. Uh, Gold tried in the fire means trials, difficulties, tribulations, real rough spots in your Christian life. And he's telling you to buy these. I counsel thee to buy of me. You need gold. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. Well, what in the world is that about? What? Now, salvation, I don't have to buy salvation. Salvation is free. That's a free gift. I don't have to spend a dollar. But here he's telling me to uh, buy something. Well, what kind of currency do I have that I could buy something? Well, the only currency that has any value as far as the Lord is concerned is your faith in his word. Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I need to submit. And I need to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you whatever you're going to bring me through. And if you believe I need to be purged so I can bear more fruit, and I need to be snipped here and there, and I need maybe at times to have some radical surgery done on me so that I could be more effective as your servant, well, I need that. I need to buy that from you so that I have something when I appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that I have something that has gone through the fire, something that comes out as gold, something where I could say, I got the victory. 
I got the victory. I overcame the world or I overcame this besetting sin. I got through it. And this is something this church doesn't have. Why? It's too comfortable. Life is too easy. Things are working out. And he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And that's at the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, that's a whole nother lesson, the nakedness and the judgment seat of Christ. I'll tell you, when you get into this stuff and you really search it out, it's scary. I don't know how anybody listening here, uh, to me who's really saved cannot be terrorized by the idea of appearing before the Lord's judgment seat with nothing to show for your service, for your effort, for your Christian life. I mean, it's, it boggles my mind how any Christian could just pass their days and their weeks with nonsense. Well, it's happening. Now he says, uh, in the last part of verse 18, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Well, what do you have here? You have infected eyes. You have pus. Okay? Eye salve, salve draws out the pus, like a boil or a ganglion. That's what's, what salve is all about. The eye salve is the Holy Spirit. Well, let's get back to the beginning here. How did the eyes get infected? Because this is a situation that doesn't appear with any of the other six churches. This is the last day's church, and it has an eye problem. It has infected eyes. From what? Well, let me bring you up to speed here. You know, my pop, he's gone now. He's in glory. He used to tell me, and he was a kid, uh, and he was lucky if he got a dime. That was a lot of money during the Depression. So he was born in 1921, and the Depression came in 1929. And once in a while, if he had a dime, he'd be able to go uh, to the local theater in his neighborhood, in Brooklyn. Uh, no, earlier, when he was young, it was Buffalo, and then later Brooklyn. And he, he sat there mesmerized uh, by the movie. And that was the silver screen. The silver screen, it was called. Uh, pictures of silver in apples of gold. It's amazing when he wrote his word new uh, that pictures had something to do with silver. And that's where the term comes from, the silver screen. I went to the silver screen. I, I, I like to spend time in front of the silver screen because film this, it was made of silver nitrate. And that's how the connection exists between the silver screen and the word of God uh, uh, seeing. Well, he, he would have that uh, a privilege maybe once a month, uh, maybe less, uh, because they were poor. My dad's family was poor, and it was depression. Uh, but the, the fascination, the attraction of the screen really, really affected him. He, he told me once how terrorized he was by the 1932 movie, so that would have meant he was 11, of a Boris Koloff, the original Frankenstein movie. Well, Things changed, and time, as time went on, we had the screen brought into our homes. This was the late 40s, 48 and 49, and my grandfather, I believe in 1949, brought a small, bought a small black and white television. I think it was, it was made by Philco. Back then, the television manufacturers, Philco and Emerson and Magnavox and Zenith and Sylvania, uh, they were producing uh, TV sets for the people who could afford them. They were quite expensive. Uh, now there's not a, a TV manufacturer left in the United States. They're all in China, Japan, Korea, all over the place. They're all gone. The last one to pull out was Zenith. Zenith had made televisions in America, I think in St. Louis, right up until around the 80s, and then they left. Well, what happened was when the little screen came in the house, the family started to gather around the little screen especially in, in New York, where I grew up, uh, because all the programming was coming out of New York. And the one who made television really popular was Milton Berle. On Tuesday night, Milton Berle had a variety show, and everything really closed down on Tuesday night. Everyone stayed at home to watch Uncle Milty, including my grandfather and my grandmother. 
Now, as I grew a little older, uh, I was in front of the TV set all the time. And they had a lot of good children's shows back then. Howdy Doody was the, the great children's show. Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, uh, Rudy Kazuti, all the, They were wonderful puppet shows for kids, wonderful shows, really good. And the cartoons were great also. So I got to see a lot of television, and uh, it turned out that television became an excellent babysitter for young mothers and kids that were growing up. And uh, <laughs> it's sad that it really got into the minds of so many children so early, and it affected me a lot, I could tell you that. Uh, but it wasn't until the uh, screens uh, became colorized that people really became fascinated with television. Now, now it was being uh, brought in color right into their living rooms. Now, let me tell you, from... The motion picture uh, theaters, to televisions in the home, to color TV around the early 60s and mid-60s, and then finally to the screens that we now carry. Uh, started at work, when I was leaving work, when I was ending my career, everyone was getting a computer put at their desk, and everyone was being urged to use this, uh, to be trained in those computers and to send emails to one another. Uh, I, I kind of resented that. I, I did all my stuff over the phone, and I, I took people at their word, unless they proved to be liars. Uh, arrangements were made over the phone, and now I was told to uh, do everything by email. And the commissioner said, you know, we have to have a hard copy, a record. I said, we do? He says, oh, yes, because let's face it, people are liars, and they're deceitful. And unless you have a record of everything, uh, you can't prove anything. I says, well, yeah, I guess so. Have we come to that? I guess so. We've come to that now. Well, the computers were on everyone's desk by the time I left, and now they're in everybody's home and before your eyes. You've got that eye infection? God help you to get right. God help you to see how it is damaging your spiritual life with your tablets or whatever your internet, whatever you got going. Get your eyes on his word. Get them out of Facebook and put them in the book so you'll avoid having to go to the Lord and say, give me some eye salve. I've got pus in my eyes. God help you. Amen. <laughs>